Okay. Um, I, I believe the last time we didn't have Bible study last Thursday, so I believe that the last time was when I played the recording of Hebrews 1 and 2. And so I want to continue a little bit in the book of Hebrews. Um, I know it's been several years since I went through that, but um, I do think that uh, the book of Hebrews is, is a very, very important book, very important writing. And for the most part, it is either the Apostle Paul or look like someone of Apostle Paul's ministry, if it wasn't he himself. Um, some people say that maybe Paul was um, not uh, revealing himself as the author because he was talking to Hebrews. But he's talking to he's talking to Hebrew Christians. I mean, it's obvious that he's uh, he's you know the third chapter starts off wherefore holy brethren protectors of the heavenly calling. Um. So, uh, but he may have. There's a possibility that he was hoping it would reach out beyond them and that other Hebrews would would consider the writing and that his name shown as the author might not be offensive to them as much as if it just didn't show who the writer was. Um, anyway, um, so we do not have any absolute proof of who the writer was of um, the book of Hebrews. You know, in chapter one, chapter two, I won't go over it, but I'll just mention the two scriptures that I have that I feel like are key scriptures. Um, well, number one in, in chapter one, verse two, where it says, he hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, um, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So his first verse is God spoke in many times in different manners in time past by the fathers or under the fathers by the prophets. But now in these last days, I don't know if I gave, I don't think I gave it to you. I think it was to the Dominicans that I gave several scriptures on the last days. Um, um, showing that all of these last days was talking about the end of the Jewish world. None of the last days are end of time, end of the world. Scriptures in the New Testament are all referring to back there. Uh, just about any place you can find a scripture that has to do with the last days, it's dealing with back there, not, not down here. Um, which many people, another thing I want to say to you about the book of Hebrews, I've heard many ministers talk on the, in the book of Hebrews and use scriptures and apply them to us that don't apply to us yet. It only would apply to us in a restored church. There were things uh, that are mentioned uh, in the in the book of Hebrews that we just don't have we just we can't apply it to us right now. This book was written it wasn't written to us it was written to Hebrews two thousand years ago, but it was during the time of the New Testament church or the divine order of God in the harvest and the end of that world, and it will all apply to us once the church is restored. So that's one of the things I think to be careful about, and I'll. If I run across scriptures like that, I'll mention it to you. The other scripture uh, in Hebrews 1, um, verse 4, it just says, um, it's talking about Jesus, the majesty on, at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, 
as he hath by an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. His position is greater. I mean, he inherited. He's the one that created the angels, heaven and everything in it, earth and everything in it. And Jesus is a higher authority, and he has a higher place by inheritance, being the son of God, not not a, an angel or servant um, of God, but but the Son Himself and the, the the express image of God. Then I always use in in um, well, I'll just mention verse eight where God, uh, the writer here is quoting in Psalms, and he says, "But unto the Son He saith, Thy throne, O God." is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness, and scepter of thy kingdom. Uh, then verse 9 says, Thou hast loved righteousness, hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So he's showing here, he's calling the Son a God, and then he's saying, God, even thy God, talking to him, your God, the Father, clearly shows there's two, two persons there in the Godhead. And then um, in chapter 2, um, and verse 9, here in, in the first chapter, it tells us he's higher than the angels. In this verse, it says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Here, what this is talking about, he was made higher than the angels as the firstborn of God, the very first creation of God, the highest position in heaven and in earth. But here in chapter two, the writer is showing that he became lower than the angels for the suffering of death, and he became a human. He came all the way down to becoming a human. He could not have died if he had been um, an angel. If he had remained celestial or an, in angelic form, or if he came to this earth like much, some men want to preach that he is God on earth, he was the Son of God but he was a human. He was just like Adam. He was a human born of God. Uh, in Luke, let me just show you. In fact, let me just screen share here. Maybe it would be good. See if it'll work. <laughs> and I guess I could maybe open this up more. How's that? So, <clears throat> can everyone see my screen okay? Okay. So, here in, in um, verse 9, where it says, he's made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Here in Luke 20, 36, and I've gave you all this before, but it says, and they're asking Jesus the question. Uh, they're, you know, Sadducees are talking to him because they don't believe in a resurrection. So they're they're saying, you know, here, here we got this woman. She's married to this man, he dies. She marries another man, he dies, and so forth. She goes, they go through all these husbands, and then they want us to know whose wife she's gonna be in the resurrection. Well. Uh, he says here in verse 35, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God being the children of the resurrection. <laughs> so this scripture is pretty plain that an angel can't die. They're going to be as the angels, neither can they die. They're, they're like angels. They can't die like angels can't die. So um, 
But Jesus came all the way down and became a human. Sub he was mortal, in other words, subject to death. But, of course, once he un overcame, where there's no sin, there's no death, James said. So he laid down his life. He couldn't have died if he hadn't have laid it down and let God take it from him as a sacrifice for you and I. Uh, then he was glorified in heaven. But anyway, uh, let's see here in four, verse 14, for as much then as the children are takers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the saying that through death he might destroy him that have the power of death, that is the devil. And, you know, that's our teaching that he took on a human form that through death, that is dying out to sin, dying out to the human uh, will, he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil, evil, the evil that works in man, um, he destroyed that in destroying sin or the temptation of sin. He overcame it through his own body. Verse 16, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. So, um, so we, we, we went through chapters one and two, um, week before last. So I wanted to talk on chapter three and possibly four if we have time tonight. So I'm just going to start reading here and commenting on it. it. said, wherefore, holy brethren, partaken of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. And this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. He, he's making a point here because the Jews looked to the law, the covenant of Abraham and the law of Moses as their saving grace of God. And he's making a point that Moses was faithful. But this man, he, he built the house. Moses was a servant. He goes on here in verse four, for every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were spoken of, spoken after. Here, I got a note here that shows the number 12, numbers 12, it says, my servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all mine house with him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently not in dark speeches, the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And that's where God smote Miriam with, with uh, leprosy. Um, just showing, I mean, that's where he's talking about here. Um, but in verse four, for every house is built by some man, but he that built all things no. is God. Moses was a servant of God to build it, but Jesus was the God of the Old Testament that gave him the pattern to build by. He was the builder. He used Moses to do the job. Uh, verse six, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if, a little word if, we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice. Remember, Brother Leninger, he, he um, felt like God gave him a revelation on this word, T-O, capital T-O, space, D-A-Y. Um, it is in, in, in Psalms 95, uh, but it's also quoted here in the Hebrews. And Brother Leninger, I remember some men questioning him on this to try 
trying to make it any just like any other today. But he said, well, brother, you're just going to have to get revelation to know that the day of the Lord is this today. Today, if you were here, there wasn't but one day of the Lord in the end of the Jewish world from the day of Pentecost to AD 70. Somebody's microphone is not muted. Um, okay. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. That word provocation is in the day that Israel provoked God. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Now, what he's mentioning here, the Canaan land, the land of promise, is a type of God's rest. It entering into entering into God's rest, which is overcoming sin, is the picture to cease from our labors. He goes on and explains that. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you a evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. See, it's hard to understand how anybody can read this and think that, you know, once you're saved, you're always saved. You can't depart from God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, capital T-O-D-A-Y. Least any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Though, where am I at here? Just a minute, let me find my place. What verse did I just read? Uh... Just a second, I'm getting there. Um, verse 18, to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that... Uh, that believe not. So see that they could, so we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now chapter four, let us therefore fear, least a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us the gospel was preached as well unto them, but the word preached to them did not profit, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place on the seventh day on this why that God did rest the seventh day from all of his works. And in this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest, he's quoting from Psalms 95, but uh, here he's using as a picture that God made everything in seven days or six days. And on the seventh day, he rested. He rested from his labors. He's saying for us to enter into our rest, we're going to have to cease from our labors like God ceased from his labor, labors to enter into um and in our rest, seeing, verse 6 here, therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? He's using this, you know, to, to show that there was a rest for the people of God. He's talking about those that didn't enter into it, but, but God speaks of another day, speaks uh, through David 
there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that's entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let me see. Uh, yeah, I wanted to read this in Revelation 14. And, and this, the 14th chapter, this is the chapter of the harvest and the end of the Gentile world and a restored church. And, you know, I've told you several times, uh, there's three messages that are given out here. Um, that uh, they fear not God, the seed. That 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 were to fear God and give Him glory, um, that Babylon has fallen and do not take the mark um, of the beast or his or the mark of his image. The same would drink of the wrath, uh, the wine of the wrath of God. Then he goes down here and said. <clears throat> Right here in verse 13, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Um, I've said many times, uh, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. The question would be, why is it more blessed to die in a certain time from that time forward than it would be, it, more blessed than it would be to die, be, try to die before that? In other words, to me, the indication is you can't enter into your rest except today, capital T-O-D-A-Y, during the day of the Lord. Um, I had a question um, in uh, one of the pastors in Mexico asked a question that I'm going to deal with this coming Monday, and he wanted to know how the 24th chapter of Isaiah if it does and how it fits into the time frame in the book of Revelations. Well, it's really a pretty interesting, um, the 24, 25, 26, 27th, and 28 chapters of Isaiah is dealing with the end of the Je Jewish world, the judgment in that world, the making up of the bride, the resurrection, of the just in Matthew 27, 52, the making up of the bride and AD 70, the destruction of, of uh, the Jewish world. And, the, and, and it also has a parallel fulfilling, the same exact thing will happen down here in the restored church. Anyway, I'm gonna go through those four chapters next week with them, but, um, Kind of, you know, some of these questions that they ask, some of them gets pretty deep, and and um, and it it gives me an opportunity to either refresh or either. Sometimes I have to do more than refresh. Sometimes I have to dig down and research and and uh, and come up with an answer, and uh, you know, so I appreciate that because it it. Um, always, um, it, it's always uh, provoking me to, to dig into the word of God. Um, anyway, so here, these people, they're, they're blessed that die in the Lord from that time forward. And that is the time See, if you go back to the 14th chapter, those of you that may be right here in the sixth verse that I saw another angel. This is, by the way, let me just go ahead and cover this right quick. We got, we got time. 
Um, in the 14th chapter here, it says, and, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, that's the church, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. No man could learn that song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. We, we learn a little bit later that this is a song of Moses and the Lamb to be able to harmonize the Old Testament or the law and grace, the New Testament to be able to make one book out of that and bring a clear understanding of what both of them projected, which was the same thing. Uh, it said, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb, whithersoever he goeth. The, these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits of God and to the lamb. and in their mouth was found no guile. Guile is deceit. That's, it's pride. It's, it, pride's always deceitful. But in other words, it wasn't in their heart, wasn't in their mind, so it didn't come out of their mouth. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It was not in their mouth. For they are without fault before the throne of God. So these were first fruits. Well, you know, we used to teach, and many of the brothers still do, that this is the bride of Christ. Well, and I agree with that to an extent. I have to explain it because the next verse, it says, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And when I would read this, I'd think, why did God start off showing there's a bride and then turn right around and show, you know, here's a restored church, another angel, messenger, flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, which is what we're working for down here in the end of the Gentile world, to have a gospel that lasts forever. It's the truth. There's not any untruth in it. We're still striving to have it all right. And we know that our ministry is still not together on our doctrine. So we know it's not all the everlasting gospel. We're still waiting for God to finish uh, giving us one mouth and the truth. And so I would look at this and I'd think, why has he done it this way? Well, it was several years later when God helped me to see that this first five verses was 144,000 bride members that were made up in the New Testament church, the early church, not down here. This does not include us. But it's in the seventh chapter of the book of Revelations that uh, he makes up 144,000 there, and that is in the Gentile world. <clears throat> And, and then I found in 1 Chronicles 27 that David had 288,000 in his governmental administration, 24,000 uh, a month served on rotation, 24,000 times 12 is 288,000. So I see two groups here of 144,000. This group was in the early church in the seventh chapter, dealing with the end of the Gentile world, is the 145,000 that will be made up down here. Um, the 144,000 is not a literal number. Uh, there's going to be a thousand thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. <laughs> There's going to be a great number in the bride. And that 144,000 number is a governmental number. It's just a type. In Israel, every tribe had 12 elders that, that 
judged the matters of those of those tribes. If it came to the trial, you might say that was their Supreme Court, like a state Supreme Court, but the the federal Supreme Court was Moses. <laughs> if we go to him, well, he, then God would give him the final answer. But in each tribe, they had 12 elders. There was rulers of thousands, hundreds, and fifties. And if it's a little bitty matter, a ruler of 50 could handle it. If it's a little bit bigger matter, they may have to get the rulers of hundreds in on it. Because those rulers of fifties were in the, was in that hundred. Then the rulers of thousands. And then, and by the way, if you look up the number, when you look up 144,000, the exact same Greek word is translated into thousands, more than one, more than 1,000. So um, it could easily mean there was 144,000. Um, just 12 times rulers of thousands times 12 is 144,000, or thousands. So it's just a picture of the government ruling element that's going to be in the bride. I think that's what you need to get out of that. But what my point is here is I saw another angel fly in the midst of having, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them to dwell on the earth, saying with a loud voice, three messages, fear God, give glory to him for the hour. That's the last, last prophetical hour of his judgment has come and made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains and waters. And there followed another angel, another message. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That does not happen until there's a angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. That's, that's the restored church. So their message, this message of Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that's in the 18th chapter, come out of her, my people has not taken place yet, not that prophecy. It's in the last prophetical hour that that'll be taken place before God judges Babylon. He will get everyone he can out of it. And then the third angel or message followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and receive his mark in his four, uh, I'm sorry, the beast and his image, um, this is, I believe, the first place after the 13th chapter where the, the image of the beast is set up. This is the first place that it's mentioned, the image of the beast, the mark, his mark of the beast and his image. The beast here is the Catholic Church, the mother of harlots, and his image is what will be set up down here um, and will place him into um, it'll place him in, it, as becoming the eighth head of the beast. Okay. It, but if you receive the mark in the forehead or in the hand, the hand's the ministry that will join up with the beast or the image of the beast system. The, uh, those that have it in their forehead will have their doctrine, their teachings, the falsehood in their thinking it'd be planted in their minds. And the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which poured out into a mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he'll be tormented with fire and brimstone, the holy place, our presence of the holy angels. And in the presence of the lamb, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. In other words, the smoke is the aftermath of the fire. We'll never, ever forget the, the judgment of at the end of the Gentile world, just like the Jews will never forget AD 70. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So, and then of course, here comes Jesus on a white cloud. That's the restored church. So that's the time that this takes place. 
Let me go back now to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Um, and the eighth verse, for if Jesus had given them rest, then they would not have to afterwards have spoken another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. He's just using that as a picture. I don't know who that is, but somebody's got their microphone on, not muted. If you look, when you talk, your name will light up. It'll light up. You can see that it's, it's, it's uh, your microphone's on. Okay, verse 12, for the word of God. Now, this is where the scripture fits in concerning entering to the rest of God and ceasing from your labors. And here's how it works. For the God, the word of God is quick. That word quick means alive. And it's powerful. This is talking about the anointed word of God. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder soul, spirit, and the joints and marrow. In other words, it, it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It'll judge the whole man, body, soul, and spirit. Um, it'll reveal to you if you've got uh, if your body is, you know, sinning against God, if you've given over to the lust of your, just the body, the human body, or the mind, if, if you, how did James say it, that if, if uh, when lust is conceived, so you can have temptation that stirs up lust, but once you conceive it is when you've made up your mind to commit the sin. So once lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin brings forth death. But the, the word of God, that's why we've got to understand the word of God. We've got to have it working in our members, in our inner man. I said here recently, I think it was in church Sunday, that you everyone needs to get rid of trying to obey laws and commandments and get busy trying to build up the inner man to work on the righteousness side of the spirit of God leading us into righteousness than rather than trying to obey a law that says, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't do this, can't do that. But if you're working on the righteous side, and building up the righteousness that's in Christ, you you will the sins will take care of themselves. You'll overcome without any problem. Um, so then it says, verse thirteen: Neither is there any creature that's not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great High Priest that's passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That we don't have a high priest that just tries to imagine what it's like to be here on this earth and suffer the temptations of a human um, you know, God had to give us the freedom of will. If he hadn't, it would have been, he could have stopped when he made the angels because we would just be servants to do the will of God. But what God's after, he's after a, an offspring of children that are righteous because they love righteousness and they they can make a choice. He won't make you be righteous. He won't make you be uh, a fallen child of his, <clears throat> but you can choose. And he gives us, really, I don't think it's all the time as hard as we try to make it. You know, Jesus said 
He said, take my yoke upon you, for I am meek and lowly. And he said, my yoke is easy. When you get yoked up with God, see, he's easy to serve because he doesn't require more of you than, he won't require more of you than what you can answer him in. If you're a child, he's not going to require more of you than your growth stage in God. He doesn't expect you to be able to do what you're in, not capable of doing, but he will help you and cause you to continue to grow. If you'll stay yoked up to him, you'll, you'll grow more and more in God and you'll develop more and you will die out to the body. It's, it's a death, but it's life to the inner man. Um, Paul said he died daily, but, 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 but every day uh, he, he became uh, greater in God. Um, you put off, when you put off sins, you, you just get more freedom. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Okay, so we did get through the third and fourth chapter, and I'll stop there because I know we don't have time to go through the fifth, but I just thought um, we might go through this book of Hebrews again and just because, uh, you know, he's, he's not only showing that Jesus came down, became a man, but he's also all through it proving that he is the son of God. He's showing why he came here. He's showing that he became as, as of the seed of Abraham, didn't take on the nature of angels to become like us. And he's not a priest that can't be touched with the feelings of our infirmities because as it says here in the 15th verse, he was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. So that tells us that we can, you know, we can overcome sin. We can, we can endure temptation. He did it. He was the example of how to do it. Um, I'll agree that, that he didn't, he didn't enter this world uh, in sin like we did. We're just a few days and full of trouble. We have to be born again. And so we, we didn't have the opportunity like Adam did to be born in, and like Jesus did, to be born in, in a garden condition where even though Jesus was an environment where uh, sin was certainly available to him and influence uh, there even more, I think, than Adam would have ever been. Uh, but some of these verses, like, you know, I'm going to talk about next week in Isaiah, where it talks about the lion, lamb laying down with a lion. That's not just talking about uh, the millennial. That's talking about in the New Testament church when, you know, God wants, uh, He does not want a dominating factor in the flesh, that the flesh, you know, tries to dominate and devour others, other people, you know, that's just the works of pride. And he's just using a picture there that no doubt in the beginning when God created Adam and Eve and created all the animals, they weren't, there was no death. The animals wasn't killing one another. A lion wouldn't devour a lamb back in that, back before sin entered into the world. But when man lost control of the animals and the animals, uh, you know, the curse went forth. But th there's a picture in that. But I will have to say it will be until the end of the millennial before a lamb will lay down with a lion and there won't be no, there won't be no animal devouring spirit there. Brother Souders, I never heard any other man say this, but Brother Souders made this statement one time. He said, lucky old cow, lucky old cow. I never, <laughs> I never even thought about animals living 
in eternity. But death is going to be done away with. And that's what Brother Siders was saying. He was saying, lucky old cow that's standing there when the last enemy's done away with, death's done away with, and that old cow is going to just live right on along with the rest of us. I don't know how that's going to work, but I just always, you know, it's a, it is a, it's a good thought, isn't it? That death's going to be eradicated. And I, I'm sure there's going to be animals throughout eternity. I'm sure God's not going to do away with the whole animal kingdom. So I don't know how that's going to work, but <clears throat> you're going to have to be just like me. If you want to find out how it works, you're going to have to make it just like I'm going to have to make it to find out. And, but that's my desire, not because I want to see what happens to the animals. I want to see a world that's without sin, that is at peace and righteous. And, us, and I want to see our creator. And I want to see what kind of world that is. If this world is so beautiful, you know, I mean, I know the corruption that's even in the greatest nation in the world, which is the United States today, it's, it's becoming more and more a corrupt nation. <clears throat> but it's had the blessings of God on it. And if you've lived in the last, you know, two generations, last 80 years, like I have, I'm not 80 yet, but I'm in my 70s. So I've lived in both generations. And I can tell you the generation before this, was a far more peaceful, less corruption, more God-fearing uh, people, greater touches of God in it than we have today uh, in this generation. And uh, this, this uh, in the book of I, Isaiah that I've been reading in and studying to answer this brother's question in, in Isaiah 24 through 28. Uh, <clears throat> it's so amazing because the Lord's talking about destroying everything. He'll take two or three verses and just talk about just ending everything. Then he'll start talking about his children that are going to get every, they're going to be blessed of God in every way. He's, he just, contrasting the corruption that was, is in the end of the world with the, with the New Testament church and or the restored church and how he's going to have a people in the midst of all of that and gather a people out of it, and he's going to judge the rest of it. And uh, it's amazing just to see how it goes back and forth, back and forth. So there's a lot of scriptures in there we use that it's sort of interesting when you put them all together. Anyway, um, if anyone's got a question or a comment, they can make it. Uh, otherwise, well, we'll I'm going to quit screen sharing anyway. Get back to our. Um, let's see. So I, I mentioned some of you weren't on here that I mentioned before that um, uh, Cindy, St. Michael, Cindy's wife, her brother, Rick Elder, has come through the surgery good. Uh, he was operated on Monday. And they, they, they repaired his aneurysm and they replaced both valves in his heart. I mean, they stopped his heart and put him on a heart machine and done all this work on it. Anyway, he's doing very well. Um, he's um, uh, yesterday he was up, I think, a couple of times and walked. And um, so he's off of the ventilator. Um, they, they did have had him on oxygen, had him on a CPAP machine, I think, at first, but I don't know where. He's at right now today. I haven't I haven't got the latest update, but as of right now, he's it's a good report. He's doing very well. So keep praying for Rick Elder, um, Cindy's brother. He's he's just in his fifties and uh, a young man to have have such a serious 
heart condition and heart operation, but this is supposed to really help him. So help us keep praying for Rick Elder, brother Bill Daniels. We want to keep praying for him, sister Julie Crafton. Um, let's keep praying for sister Crow, sister Smith. My wife is, she's been down in her back the last few days. She's, uh, you know, her back's bothering her. She's been having to keep a cold pack on it and things and kind of staying laid down as much as she can. So please keep praying for her. Um, Oh, let's see, my my daughter, my grand, my niece, uh, Bonnie Garza, has got pancreatic cancer. Please pray for her. Brother Goss, a church up in Keswick, Canada. Keep praying for that family, Brother Goss, his health, and for the church. Also, the Dominican Republic, God's just really doing things in the Dominican Republic. It's just, things are just going, you know, just I mean, it's like it's on fire over there. People are just new people coming in. People's excited about this message. And so I didn't mention uh, Brother Green again. I did earlier to those who first got on. He had a little trouble yesterday with his blood pressure and his diabetes. But he's got it under control now, I think. But let's, I told him we'd keep praying for him. And so please do that. He did go to the hospital, but they let him go home but his blood pressure was very high and he does, you don't have diabetes real bad. The problem with them over there is they can't hardly afford medication. So they get in a habit of not taking medication till they get sick. Then they get on their medication and get leveled off and doing good. And then they don't take it anymore. And then it's another cycle. So I've really been working on him to stay on his medicine. In fact, I've got somebody in, in America that's paying his prescription bill every month for him, giving him an offer to do that. And so he's been doing better on that, but I don't know why he had problems yesterday. All right. Why don't we just everyone turn your microphones on, get it off of mute, and let's let's all pray together and mention these prayers and give God the praise for the good word of God and his blessings on our lives. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord Touch we praise you. Blessed be the Lamb of God. Thank you. Give you glory. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right. Amen.